Okay, so we're uh, back in studio with Norman, in virtual studio with Norman. As you can tell, it's uh, we're raising the bar here. Uh, I, I mean, this is the the imagery of of uh, Norman and I uh, mid afternoon, but the the look and feel is something uh, relaxing into the evening. And uh, you know, I, I I couldn't be happier to be here with my friend Norman. And uh, I, I my initial conversations with with Norman before we hit uh, go live was. Uh, focused around um, appearances and uh, projection of of um, your better self, how you want to have people see yourself in the world, and uh, and 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 Norman's taken that embodiment very seriously. And uh, Norman, so why don't you uh, elaborate a little bit on, on on what you've been up to for the last couple of weeks? much and uh, thank you for the introduction it's very very kind and humble of you for me um it has really been a shift of these last few weeks since the last time that we talked that has i, I have started to break a, another paradigm that i have found that has come up and a paradigm is a, is a boundary that we that we can't see but we know that is there and it's a it, it it's tied very closely to our 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 own personal growth whether it be spiritually mostly but also um, it's a belief and it is, it keeps us captive to a degree and puts a silly ceiling on how far we can really go because we can never exceed further than we believe in ourselves and we'll never outgrow or outperform our own identity. And uh, for me, as I've been striving and working towards goals and setting plans and doing things, I've had to wait for things to kind of catch up even in myself, even with my own training and everything that I have put myself through, I have still had to battle these things, you know, not battle, but I have still had to conquer these obstacles myself. And one of these is my inside world was not in alignment with my exterior world. And meaning that I was thinking much greater of who I was and the picture of myself was much greater on an inside vision than I was actually presenting myself. And it actually has a profound effect because whether we like it or not, we, none of us like to be judged, but we are judged on our appearance to a degree. First impressions are important. And a lot of these things and the way you carry yourself, all these things play into how people receive us, whether it be good, bad, or indifferent. And that's just the fact the subconscious mind works like that. And if we consistently see ourselves dressing in a certain way, acting a certain way, it actually affects us as well. So if we see ourselves dressed down, casual, baggy pants, sloppy dress, not, not taking care of ourselves, personal hygiene or whatever it might be, that directly correlates back to our own view of our self-image. And for me, I kind of came to this conclusion. It was like this shift more recently than not. But if I want to lead and help inspire other people in life, I should present myself as that kind of person, even on the outside, because I actually feel and actually confirm that I carry myself differently when I look the part, so to speak. So that's really good. Okay. So I have a couple points on that. Um, now there's a, there's a certain, uh, you know, type of image you're wearing a tie today, which is great. Um, <laughs> I want to maybe, I want to point to somebody who, um, who comes to mind when I think of, of a, a public intellectual or, you know, he'll really like that. I called him a pump public intellectual. I think he really would like that as, you know, as so, so would I, but I'm, a, I'm in a similar space. He's a giant. I'm not so much, but there's um, a fellow by the name of Lex Friedman. Um, have you heard of Lex Friedman? You know, at first, at first it's like maybe, but I, I it does not bring up a, a distinctive memory of him. No. 
Okay, so he's a, he's a really good um, podcast interviewer, and he brings on a lot of very interesting um, and high-profile thinkers onto his, um, onto his podcast called The Lex Friedman Show. Um, and so uh, I think he's a good interviewer, um, and like I said, he has lots of really good guests on. He also um, has that very simple dress as well, where he has, I think, I haven't really noticed, but I think it's like a, a white shirt and a black tie. I think it's kind of his, you know, his uniform, right? Yeah. So my my question to you is that on a little bit of self-reflection, um, as your network grows and you start to recognize other leaders in, in, a, in, in the field, uh, other influencers, would you say that you would um, prejudge somebody if they, they didn't have... Um, you know, that kind of formalized attire on? Like, how much would you discount you personally because you've made that, that so it's a little bit of a self-reflection kind of question. It is, and perception is projection. So as we perceive the world to be, is projected back to us, you know I mean, to a degree. What we see in ourselves, we see, we see in others. And that is the way that reality works. And, um, you know, that is a really good question. And thank you for answer, you know, asking it. And it is, it is, it is even causing me to go, huh, would I do that? And kind of put myself, and that's the, the beauty of thinking and the power of, because it helps create new neurology to do that. But my first impression is no, I would not, because I'm very optimistic and open. But what I would say is that off of the first instinct, it will cause somebody to go, and you, yeah, you're going to do an evaluation. My first impression is, is for some people, this might seem a little uptight, you know, and, and by seeing somebody in a tie compared to a polo, you know, business formal compared to business casual, it can seem as a little more relaxed, open, not as stringent or, you know, some of these things, but it's all dependent on each individual and all these things that go behind the scenes of how they evaluate and, you know, um, look at the world, you know, so there's much more below behind the scenes. I think there's an appropriate time for each. And right now I'm kind of in the phase of learning when and where and the how and all the pieces put together of, you know, maybe what's too much for sometimes and not enough, you know, because there are times that I've, I've worn polo and I'm like, this is nice, but let's try doing a tie. I think I might feel a little more, you know, and I can even notice the difference in myself that way. Yeah. So let me see how this, this statement kind of sits with you and, and see if it really resonates is to say, for Norman right now, this is the approach to be very uh, organized, professional, and show up to be very professional and organized. Uh, and and it's it's more about Norman and his projection, right? Um, but yes. you don't. Yes. But you don't judge other people, uh, you know, with that projection. Would that be Would that be fair? Absolutely. Um, I have made it a. I have made it a value and a habit to and a priority to meet people where they are. Oh, that's very in good. Their that's space, nice. In their space and their time, because you, there, there is a healthy balance of pushing, pulling, influencing, leading, and, you know, and guiding people and stuff, even myself included. I have had obviously mentors and leaders and people in my life that have um, dramatically changed the way I look at the world, but there's a balance between healthy and obsessive of doing that. You more want to pull somebody a little bit rather than push somebody too much because then people become more resistant. So, but if you can match and meet people where they are, they're going to be much more open yeah. and, and acceptable to you. You know what I mean? Speaking of meeting people where they are, we can imagine a little bit because our background, it's like, I wonder where that waitress is or waiter, because, you know, if we're hungry, we should order some appies and, and, and maybe a drink here, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, kind of a, uh, I'm not a big scotch drinker, but a scotch on the rocks would be kind of nice right now, actually. Like, uh, you know. Norman, it's in the morning. You're, it's <laughs> time weak. aside of anything, but <laughs> <laughs> you kind of have that feel like we're having a sophisticated conversation about, you know, detailed stuff. Like, okay, let's, you know, let's, 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 let's 
let's do this. Like, <laughs> but the background give us that feel if it's kind of evening or winding down, you know, relaxing yeah, yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. So we can transcend <laughs> our, our morning atmosphere or our morning reality. And we're actually, yeah, I mean, it was only, that's the only trigger to say, um, you know, scotch, right? Scotch drink. And, and it, it somehow put you there. Cause I don't imagine you wake up and then, you know, have a couple of shots of scotch. I mean, I'm not going to no, judge just, you, Norman. It's fine. <laughs> Black coffee. That's just the, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. Same here. <laughs> so let's talk about the scotch for a minute. Are you? Um, is it like kind of a peaty scotch, or do you? You know, do you? Uh, are you a connoisseur of this this kind of uh, indulgence? Not really. I did go through a phase, um, but because of my background, I know we mentioned a little bit about it in the previous one. I know we kept some of it in the uh, to a little bit on the curious, mysterious side, but because of some of my more medical side of my history. It was something that I never really allotted myself getting into and never really, in, I, you know, in, in, indulged in the pastime of drinking or partying or anything like that for obviously more health reasons than anything. Um, but I did go through a phase, you know, um, and I did try, you know, the whole scotch and cigar thing at one point. And I really have come to the realization that, you know, um, at least the cigar side of it is not for me. Definitely. Like I don't, I, my, you are what you put in your body and to a degree and it's a healthy balance of things, but, um, I have not really, it is not part of my routine to go out and sip scotch and, you know, that kind of thing. No, not at all, but I have nothing okay. against anybody that wants to, you know, that is part of their, them either. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is, this episode's a little bit of the, of the reveal. I'd like, I'd like to maybe, I'd like to spend some time talking about the, um, uh, is it proper to say whether it's the condition or it's the, the disease that, that you've lived with? Um, uh, is that, is that appropriate? I always find myself sort of like, uh, you know, scrambling for words to, to describe it. Yeah. Right. That's, it, to me, it really doesn't make a difference. I I personally don't take offense to either one because I I feel that they're somewhat the same. Condition sounds a little more dumbed down than disease. I think disease sounds a little more drastic. Um, you know, that if you were to say, you know, like cancer or or some sort of like something like that, but that's just my own impression and everybody's is gonna be different. Um I personally myself thought of it kind of as a an impact, impactful life, a condition that I had. That was like my own interpretation and my own view of, of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, why don't we spend some time talking about it? Cause it's my, my intention actually to, to spend some time on, on some, on some outreach and to try and network within those communities that, that could support, uh, you know, not only you, uh, but, but the show. Right. And so we're being very transparent with that. It is about reach and it's about uh, reaching others who um, can benefit from the leadership and the story. And, you know, so actually people can meet you where you are at. Right. So in, it, actually, the reciprocal of what you just said is that you want to actually bring people to where you're at. And I can I can bear witness to the fact that, you know, Nor seriously, Norman is a very well put together individual. And yeah, I mean, you're welcome. Uh, you, you have, um, you, you're more organized and I think well balanced, more well balanced than most people that I actually come across. And for somebody that has gone through the trauma, the medical trauma that you've gone through, uh, it's quite remarkable. And yeah, I think we should, you know, spend some time talking about that today. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm, 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 I'm really an open book when it comes down to that. I will say that I have, I definitely make an effort to do that way. And it has, has made leaps and bounds. Although, you know, it, it is a, it is a seesaw back and forth a lot of times with personal growth and development and, you know, getting organized, like my desk is a little cluttery, like where it should be a little more clean, you know? So yeah. And, and it's all about self-awareness as we grow. So Now we can't hear you. So you had an operation. What do we talk about you the operation out. itself? You cut out just a little bit on your audio there for a few seconds. Okay, um, I'll have to but clean that up. Yeah, and I just noticed, noticing your mouth was moving. 
you're I'm hearing you. I heard uh, operation basically. So right before that. Okay. Well, let's um, let's start with the you know the operation, the kind of procedure that happened, the recovery, and just just kind of go through the whole narrative of um, you know what you know how how it progressed, what what the what the condition was, and uh, you know just just let's just tell your story. Thank you. Um, okay, so I I lived with uh, I guess if you could consider a, a pretty life altering condition for most of actually thirty years of my life. Um, that condition being epilepsy, and for me, I it all started um, physically in this lifetime at about thirteen months old. I say physically in this lifetime because we can talk about this at a different point, but I believe that us being spiritual beings, um, having an earthly experience in a physical body, we, I believe in reincarnation and certain other aspects. So we can get into that, that whole set of things on a different time. But I believe that I truly had these effects. I brought them into this world with me. Hence why things started showing up at about such a young age. Um, and this is a whole different values and belief system. Um, but at 13 months old, I had a, a stroke. And obviously, I was too young to remember this stroke, um, other than what I've been told. And even now, my mother, who was in her earlier mid sixties, has a hard time, you know, recounting some of these things. So a lot of it is still left left a mystery. But a few of the facts I do know is that they never did actually figure out why I had the stroke um, or what caused it. They never found a blood clot or a, you know a block of oxygen or anything like that. And um, I was paralyzed for a period of time in the hospital and I can see how that would be very judgment detrimental to somebody at such a young age. Um, at most 13 months old kids are crawling and they're learning how to walk and, you know, very developmental at that, at that time, you know, even my own son, who's a little older than that now, um, I couldn't imagine like what that would do. And I, I do know a family that has a similar situation. Um, but that, Obviously, there's a lot of grace area in that whole spot of my life, but that's when it all really started for me. And the next really big thing that I understand in my life was at about nine years old, I had a second stroke. And obviously, there's a lot of dark blackout period there where I don't remember a lot of things. I really don't recall a lot of my the condition of having epilepsy until I was more like a preteen maybe a little younger, I would say maybe 10, 12, you know, and then it kind of becomes obviously a little bit easier to remember just as I think is our development of our memory and certain things work. But for me, um, it really all conditioned me. And I believe my family to treat me a certain way, uh, tiptoe around me, the poor form and the, you know, the, and all these things. And some of my background in my family history, obviously there's been conditioning with my parents and certain things that played into the way that they raised me. And on top of having seizures and, you know, they tried to give me a normal life. They did. Um, you know, I, I played T-ball, the almost pony league in, in baseball. And that was a fairly safe sport. You know, I skateboarded as a kid and, you know, we went camping and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But at the same time, there was always that sense of a watch out for Norman. You know, oh, oh, you know, are you okay, Norman? Or, you know, do you need anything? You know, and that, that, that baby in this, you know, making sure I was safe instead of just letting me be free. And I can't blame, especially my mother for that. My dad was the opposite. He wanted me to kind of excel and, you know, be free. And he was more laid back than my mom was. And now looking back, I can see why my mom was the way she is. Now that I understand my mother and some of the, her things that she has dealt with. Um, it's a direct way she treated me and raised my sister. But through all this stuff, these, it really became to light as I got more into school and started developing as an adolescent and a preteen and all this stuff that these things started coming out. But deep down inside, I always felt different. Like I knew that there was something more. Yeah, I was a different kid, but I knew that there was more to me, that I had a bigger purpose and things in life. But I always put in the background of, of my own self-care. And I think a lot of that had to do with the way that I was raised. And for me, um, I can remember showing a lot of these signs of the the condition would be rolled into the way I showed up in the world and the way other people treated me. Because once they knew I had a seizure, it was, you know, 
oh, watch out for Norman. It went from beyond my family to my friends I was making and things like that. And it really caused me to really second guess myself, doubt my abilities and put everybody else's care before my own. And that in itself can be very detrimental to somebody's self-development and belief system of their self. And as I became a teenager, and of course I was having seizures, I wanted to drive, I wanted to date, I wanted to have, you know, all these, you know, experiences, but it was always like that condition was holding me back. Although I tried to show up as, I never thought of myself really as a, as a, as an epileptic, as somebody with a, a life altering condition. But then again, my conditioning and the way I was raised and all these aspects played into exactly how I showed up like that. And um, it really caused me to really take a close look at myself, but just find satisfaction in everybody else's life, really. And I disregarded my own self like, oh, it's not a big deal. Like I, I, I remember one time I was, I mean, my, we'll skip a little bit. Because, you know, like a lot of stuff really didn't start making leeway until I was really kind of independent around 15 or so. And then really a lot of stuff in life happened. But I remember like wanting to learn how to drive and stuff. And I couldn't necessarily because I was having seizures. And that's, you know, uh, six months, at least in Washington State. And I think maybe nationwide here in the United States. But you can't drive for a matter of months and without doctor's signature and all that kind of stuff. And um it really, I had to walk everywhere, take the bus. And, um, you know, I, at one point I had a seizure while driving and then I wasn't really responsible about it. I wanted to drive again, or I would not actually go through the proper channels of doing it, you know, reporting it. I just kind of made that decision myself to not drive and that's okay. But at the same time, it's like, I was not really owning up to the responsibility of what was happening, you know? Um, but for me, the, for instance, like when I became a father, my oldest daughter is now 21. Her mom, I knew for a long time before we even had her, but she didn't want me to have my daughter without me, with, with being by myself. And yes, I had a partner and stuff, but she restricted me on the basis of having a seizure. And I, I can't blame her. Looking back, I understand why. Because obviously, if I had a seizure, I was incapacitated. Well, that's that's a whole other story. But really, things for me didn't start picking up until about a teenager, and all these different aspects. I think maybe I went into them a little bit before of some of these things that um, directly affected me. But it all really changed when I started actually going from what I would call a mediocre somewhat of a job. And I, I use that loosely because I have nothing against it. It's a very necessity, but I went from, I, I, I leveled up my own responsibility and image of myself to a degree. And I took a more professional stance and responsibility on. And I say that because I went from being a waiter and a dishwasher and a restaurant worker to a, a construction worker, basically being my own boss and foreman with a lot more responsibility, working on multi-million dollar, billion dollar projects, exclusive things. And, you know, so for me, that was a big leap in my own growth. And um, that's where really a lot of things changed because I was playing in the big boys game, so to speak, than what I was used to. And the responsibility of driving came into effect. A, 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 a box truck, not just a car, a box truck. So you're talking, you know, 18, 20,000 pound vehicles, you know, with equipment in it, running heavy machinery, you know, all this kind of stuff, quality, top notch um, service and stuff. But because I was have seizures, I didn't tell my bosses at the time that I had seizures. Um, and I ended up crashing a couple of work trucks. And um, this whole process obviously led to me really having to be honest with myself and other people about what I was denying myself really of, of I was it's like I was almost denying myself of who I really was and in the process I left that job for a period of time and it led me to another monumental shift in my own self but I had a craniotomy at 30 years old 
and I know we skipped over a lot of different stuff, but that's kind of the broad scale. And at 30 years old, I made the decision along with my then wife to undergo a life altering brain surgery to, in hopes that I would get my life back. So that, that is really, I think where I, the reinvention, the first step to where I am right now really started right then. And that's now been 12 years ago. That's great. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, yeah. Was that, is it, is it difficult to do the, you know, to do the narrative of this story? Is it, is it something that you like to talk about or is it something you want to kind of move past? You know, no, I don't mind talking about it. I, I'm a firm believer that it's okay to revisit and, and, and recall the past for things like this as to give people kind of a perspective of the experiences and, and kind of what shaped and made us. But I also believe that there is a balance between living in the past because when we recall the past, we put ourselves spiritually and physically reliving some of the events, no matter how good or how bad they are, your body remembers those happy traumatic it doesn't make like your body remembers that because with every experience we have there is a equal emotional signature that is tied with that memory and so it, it's okay to do that but at the same time like you need to come back to the present but if it gives somebody a good grounds of perspective of some some of the history and you know without really of course there's a lot more detail that we skipped over but we can get into more of that at a, at a different time as we kind of drill into where and why and the how and all those kinds of things, you know, but, um, that my life really started at about 30, I feel, and we can kind of move forward from here or however you, you know, however we see to proceed. But. Well, that's the, that's the thing. I think, I mean, we had, we had the idea or I'm at least painting the picture for the development of, of the Norman brand and the Norman show basically, yeah. um, to, uh, to engage with the Epilepsy Foundation. I, I think that's a, a good, solid starting point. And um, uh, I think that there's there's a base out there of, of younger versions of Norman uh, that, you know, male and female, that, that may be going through some similar um, questions and, uh, and, and some crisis and don't quite have that complete, um, trajectory uh, in in place, and so you have arrived, so to speak, to say that um, you know this is something that 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 you've gone through um, uh, a life altering operation uh, is is something that you've you know come through onto the other side, and I, I think I remember you saying that the the doctors and the surgeons were somewhat skeptical about the the extent of a full recovery. And, uh, I think you've, you know, surpassed, surpassed their expectations. Is that, was that a care? Was that a, was that a fair characterization? It was yes. And, um, you know, a little more drilled down details that if you went, we would kind of want to start with the basis of the surgery and yes, it was, uh, you know, quite a, a road leading up to that. Um, but when it came down to it, um, for instance, it took a long time for them to actually pinpoint exactly what it was and where and how much and a lot of the details of, um, they had to really kind of get to be able to make this surgery successful as it was. But at the same sense, they did leave about 20% of the scar tissue in my head from having seizures for 30 years of my life. Mm -hmm. And the equivalent of what was removed from my head was about three inches of my, of my gray matter. Um, you know, which sounds very significant and looking at it like three inches is really not a lot, but in the, in the, in your brain, you're like, wow, you know what I mean? But at the same time, like they told me that I would have to be on medicine the rest of my life, that the possibility, you know, that there was, you know, I, I don't remember if they gave me a, like a percentage amount, but they gave me a high probability that I wouldn't have seizures, but they also didn't leave it to discount that, Hey, you, you're going to have to take medicine. They basically told me I was going to have to. They didn't say you might have to. They said you're basically going to have to take medicine the rest of your life. And there is a possibility you still might have seizures. You know, and they give you all the risks and all that kind of stuff going into it. But um, it was obviously ultimately a risk I was willing to take. 
and it paid off because I just surpassed 12 years, um, July 7th from having a, having a seizure. So. Congratulations. Congratulations. You know, it's, it's probably a date that, that, you know, will live in your life forever. And, and, uh, probably as significant as, as some of the, you know, other major milestones that happen for people like births of children and marriages and, and stuff like that. Right. Or sometimes divorces. Right. <laughs> we were in a, we went out for, we went out for dinner the other day and, you know, because of COVID it's like this um, reopening. Right. And I think the United States is a little bit ahead of Canada, but we, we were in the restaurant and a, a guy had come out of the restaurant and was like, Woohoo! And getting divorced. <laughs> I know somebody recently that uh, she's kind of in the middle of getting divorced as well, and she actually um, threw herself like a bought herself like a little cake, and you know had like a little party or whatever. Like yeah, so, you know, and yeah, she posted a picture like you know of when they got married and themselves now, and like the, yeah, whatever, whatever works. Well, it was interesting, yeah, and I've actually seen couples actually engage in that too, like a celebration of it. it I mean, it it sounds weird, but it's like. What you know? Why not? I mean, maybe relationships are not meant to last. You know, as long as we think they, you know, they 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 last, right? Things things sir, uh, things serve us for a period of time. Jobs, relationships, situations, people doesn't matter what it is. Thoughts, conditioning, everything. You know, and, and, and unless you are just so closed off to growth and remain that same way, and there are some people that do, and that's okay because that's where they're at. But um, natural, healthy progression, you should outgrow certain things in your life. And I have a, I, for instance, and it's, a, it, it's always about perspective because you have a choice. You can either look at it from a negative side or you can look at it for what it is and grow and go through the process and things. And for instance, I have a friend I've known for 25 years since you know we were sophomores in high school. He lost his leg uh, due to a pretty bad neural, uh, nerve disorder at 28 years old. And he's, as his disease progresses, he's been more and more confined to a wheelchair and certain things, you know, and that he's had back surgeries and stuff. But when he lost his leg, he started a tradition and he still does it annually every year on the date of the anniversary of losing his leg, but he throws uh, a legger. I, I did say that, right? It's a legger. He throws a party in celebration of losing his leg. <laughs> <laughs> like so it's the comedy right so how does yes. that change your disposition when you're kind of poking fun at it and you invite yes. people around you to you know it's like yeah i i, I hey maybe that's that's a, a key into some sort of advanced therapy technique right that it's like no time for woes me just you know if you can't laugh at it then what you know, you know what's what's the use of it right they did a pirate theme, I think uh, it was last year, and they do they, they do different themes and they change it up. But none of us are getting out of your life, so you might as well embrace life to the best that we can. Because I mean, yeah, you. I mean, if you want to curl up in a corner, then you know. I mean, and that's that's your choice. But at the same time, you might as well make the best opportunity for what we have, and when it you know when it comes, and embrace life as it is. And that's really like what drives me is to help elevate not only myself, but to help inspire and elevate other people's lives. And how somebody asked me the other day, what is it that you do? And I said, you know what? I said, I help create leaders and I help, I inspire to help people become the best versions of themselves. Right. That, okay. that's what I do. Well, Norman, I think what we should do then is that as we, as we discuss our outreach plan for the show and the Norman franchise, right? Um, let's, let's, let's try and, or I'll propose this is that we, we sure will approach, uh, you know, the Ep epilepsy foundation. I don't know whether they'll answer us or not, but why don't we make, um, a concerted effort to also, um, outreach in other areas that are not related to, it, it may be very, uh, very healthy. So every time we ask, uh, you know, the epilepsy foundation or something in that particular area that represents your past let's also deliberately try and move in a direction that's not um, in, in, in that sort of specific direction. Um, and then, you know, let's, let's just kind of measure the results and, you know, see what kind of reception we get. And at least we've attempted with both, I think, because you do have a lot to offer. Um, uh, 
a community and individuals without having the you know the the the, the condition or of epilepsy as the as the as the um, the flag, you know, as the as the the front foremost sort of uh, representation uh, represented piece. Do you know what I mean? I do, and you know, epilepsy for me was kind of the start of everything. That was like the basis of my identity. And I lived that identity for 30 years of my life, but that doesn't mean that I have to remain glued to that identity. I mean, and if that works, if, if I was still there, then, you know, like, but you're right. Like that doesn't have to be the end necessarily. And you can either use that and that is a good basis for whatnot. But at the same time, like I have, I feel I have far surpassed that that sense of identity that I had around epilepsy itself, but that doesn't mean that there's not value provided within the community because there are people that are given an equal opportunity and chance and to overcome certain things. But that is just one aspect of my overall story. You yeah, know? I think I think the, the most in, potentially inspired. Um, inspiring story would be that that younger version of Norman that that you know looks at you and said you know really can just say that that's somebody that I really want to uh, you know I want to find inspiration from because think of all the trauma emotionally um, that that you went through and those direct words of wisdom uh, as as a hero, this is the name of the show. Every everyday heroes, with Norman, right? So, I think that you know this. This could be. I mean, I, I'd be very excited to see somebody's life uh, orientation change because they 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 understood your story. I think that would be, you know, really really good, very uh, inspiring. You know, and, and uh, thank you. And you know, talking about. Um, you know, like inspiring others, you know, we perception is projection and we, I, I tend to, we, well, not just me, but we all tend to attract, you know, that, that concept of what life is, but there are so many other people that are out there that want to help and inspire others that I'm not the only one. And it's about finding the community and embracing the differences, but also a sense of belonging of the people that are a little different in life. And that I hold dear to my heart because I, I understand that to a degree. Yes, everybody's experiences and all those things are different, but we all share an element in common and that there's just something a little different about us that not everybody else will experience in life. And we all will play different cards and lessons and all this, you know, we can get in all that at a different time. But when it comes down to it, that it's, it's, it's about bringing out that sense of uniqueness in somebody else, despite what they've been having to go through, whether it be seizures or, you know, um, anything else in life, you know what I mean? Emotional abuse, it doesn't matter, but it's about helping somebody bring out that strength and there's power in that. Okay. So yeah, let's, let's, let's talk about abuse for a minute, just to change the subject. So, um, say somebody was, say that was a theme for, for a particular show. And it definitely can be is that, you know, somebody is in a, in a, in a rather destructive kind of relationship. Right. It's you know, I mean, we, we can we can paint various different uh, pictures of, of, a, of a destructive relationship, whether it's abuse, <laughs> abusive physically or emotionally. Or I think intuitively people know that, that, that the relationship's not, um, you know, not right for them or it's it's it's, it's not helping them, you know, grow as a, as a, as a person. So wh how would you how would you begin to frame that as um, as a leader and a hero? I mean, I'm going to keep saying that because that's the theme of our show. Um, but you know, we're not, we're not, it's not really our starting point. It, it's, it's been the, the hero designation has been, you know, something that, that I assigned to you. So you may not even be comfortable with that. Uh, you know, that it doesn't bother. I actually, I feel kind of honored and, and privileged to have that, you know, cause I've never really considered myself a hero, but I think that we're all a hero to somebody. We all are influencers and leaders, whether it be to your wife and kids and just a few people, or whether it be to thousands of people, social media, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're a Tony Robbins or whether you're just somebody that is, you know, has a few employees or even, you know, like I said, just your, your, your own kids, you're a hero in 
a leader to them because they look up to you. So no matter what scale it is, we're all somebody, we're all a hero in somebody's eyes, you know. And we all have that potential within us, right? Um, but, uh, you know, what is it that we, what is it that you really kind of want to bring out about the, you know, like the, the abuse side or the manipulation side of, um, of, of, of all this? Well, okay. So we're, we're talking about a particular situation and somebody's in an abusive situation and how would you begin to frame that? I mean, if, if, if I was, if I was that individual, you know, staring across the table at you and I've just told you about um the emotionally abusive relationship destructive uh relationship that i've been in and by the way that's not the case but <laughs> you know uh, but, but that's the thing i'm sitting across you know from you and you can you can feel that it's like i you know i just feel trapped or there's there's something that's just i can't get out of a spiral it's uh you know it's just it's um uh, there's a lot of negativity in my life and uh, things aren't just not working out. So, you know, what, 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 how would you how would you begin that, that, that sort of framing? You know, for me, um, I'm kind of looking back at my own journey uh, through some of these things, but through my own sense of experience, you just really need to show up and be present for the person to start with because somebody in that space their sense of self is so undermined at the time that you're going to have, you, you really are not going to pull them or you're not going to push them. You're going to have to very gently kind of coax them and just really show them and be present. And that's really where it's all going to start because somebody in that situation is not necessarily going to just instantaneously be receptive and open to guidance and help because in the back of their mind they've been conditioned to the what ifs and oh my gosh if that and you know all these things and they're going to be very anxious and you know well if i do this they're going to, you know and all that kind of things and i had been there myself and but the best thing you could do is kind of pull them out of it a little bit and just be present and show them that you actually care and that you're investing in them and give them a little bit of hope and perspective and bring out their strengths and, and bring out that person that's been squashed down so much because they feel so inferior at the time that until they really get a sense of, of the positive light and you can really show them through the other side of what would be considered like that fear factor, so to speak, or that, that darkness on the other side of that illusion that there is hope and light and things like that, you're going to have a difficult time really getting them. I recently saw somebody and my first instinct is want to help. And there is a time and a place to do it. But I recently saw somebody walking through the grocery store with a black eye. Mm. And it really makes you stop and think and hold space for that person. But also too, like people have to be ready to want to change. They have to have had enough. The woman that keeps going back, I'm not saying it ha always has to be a woman because it was a man at one point that stayed. That was me, you know, um, and that's a, another story for a different time. But, you know, men do it, too. We stay where it's comfortable and we settle for less than we deserve. And because a lot of it ties back to our self-image. And until you're really ready and have absolutely had enough, there's not a lot somebody can do for you. But you mm -hmm. can just meet them where they are. Sounds an awful lot like um, like like an addiction mentality, right? Like you've heard that someone really has to be able to face themselves in the mirror and confront, you, you know, their reality before you, you can actually, uh, as somebody supportive in their life, actually be there to help them. Because there's this inertia that actually begins from the person, and and it, without that initial movement from the individual from the you know from the person that needs help you can't help them until they get the thing moving right is that would that be fair to say it is yes and you know important it's coming to mind but you cannot heal and i'll say this probably more than once but you cannot heal in the environment that made you sick 
Mm. I don't say there's a lot of things in life that are impossible, but you cannot heal the environment that made you sick. It's it, that is probably one of the things that would prove the most challenging in that situation. And the sum of who you are surrounded with is, is part of your identity and your conditioning and certain things. And for me, I had to remove myself, no matter how hard, difficult or uphill battle it was, I had to remove myself from the situation before I could even think and really start making momentum to actually gain any ground on my own self-defeating views and all these things. But everything worthwhile is uphill. I've really come to understand that. And that, it, it, ask yourself why. I read a book recently. It's called Start With Why by a, a gentleman by the name of Simon Sinek. And he has multiple books. But it really goes back to why you do things instead of the how and the what. But he maybe brings up a good point is if you're going to do anything in life and you come across any type of obstacle or anything that you want to do, run it through your filter of why. Ask yourself why you're doing something. Why am I staying? Why am I doing this? Why, you know, and all those things. And if you do that, you'll find yourself really making better decisions in your life, no matter how hard or painful. I've got a perfect end to this week's episode. Um, I would like you to articulate why you're doing this show. Why am I doing the show? It's because it's what drives and inspires me. I have pulled myself from a fairly dark place in my life at different periods of time through my own growth. And I see the potential in other people. And I understand what it was like for myself to go through it. And I see the potential in other people to be able to do the same thing. And what inspires me and what drives me is to not only elevate my own self, but most of us, most of us are not even living close to what we are able to accomplish. But so many people want those things, but they lack the guidance and the know-how and the circumstances and the environment and the people to be able to do those things. And if you can meet people where they are and actually take time to invest in somebody and provide value to somebody else, they're more prone and susceptible to accepting those things and being open to those things rather than if you try and force something on them, sell them an idea or, you know, whatever it might be or a product or, you know, whatnot. But if you can provide value to somebody and plant seeds, you are making a difference in somebody else's life. And leading by example and working towards something, you inspire other people. If you're enthusiastic and passionate, that's contagious. Absolutely. And not everyone's going to actually step out of that zone. But at the same time, like, it makes people go, well, if they did it, maybe it's possible for me too. Maybe they'll finally have enough. And just knowing that, is enough for me to keep going. And yes, I do it for myself first and then my family, but it's really about those people that want change, that are ready for change, but lack all the characteristics and the steps to know how to actually get it done. And that's what you want this show to be able to, to do for people. Yes. That's, that's very uh, heroic, noble, and I'm looking forward to continuing the journey with you. Okay, stay with me for a few minutes, and uh, uh, it's it's been really great. Thanks to everybody for tuning in.